for those who I haven't met, my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm the um, executive director of our Beale Institute for Entrepreneurship. Happy Election Day to everyone. Um, I'm also a professor at Weatherhead, uh, my office now. Um, and um, it's great to welcome uh, Michael. And you pronounce it, is it Felice? Uh, it's done many ways. It can be Felice, Felici. As long as it's not a swear word, it works. Excellent. Um, well, Michael, thank you for taking the time to do this. We really appreciated your partnership and your support of students um, on campus and your role working with our IP Venture Clinic. I know um, many folks that have engaged with you in, in this very strange year that we're in and a lot of Zoom sessions, but your presence on campus has been um, really felt and meaningful. And, you know, today's session for those on Zoom and, and LinkedIn is to share a bit more about the, uh, the IP journey. Um, I see our friend Catherine Gullett has joined as well. Welcome, Catherine. Um, and for those that are either on Zoom or LinkedIn, if you have questions, we want to make this very interactive. So if you have questions for Michael, just put them in the chat. And um, Doug and I will also be monitoring uh, LinkedIn, and we can make sure that we share the questions with Michael. So Michael, with that, over to you. Sure. And raise hands will also work. We have a a small enough group today that I think we can take questions on the fly. So uh, with a wonderful introduction, I'm going to pat myself on the back a little more, tell you about, about myself. So I am I am a patent attorney. Uh, I went to engineering school here and law school here. And then I went to the West Coast and practiced for more years than I care to admit. And I'm here on sabbatical for this year, uh, teaching third year students in the intellectual property venture clinic. For those of you who are not aware of that, it's a, a clinical program. We run it like a law firm and third year students under uh, my supervision interview clients and uh, assist them with patents and trademarks and copyright issues and file patent applications in the patent office, and file trademark applications in the trademark office and copyright applications in the copyright office. We're doing things a little bit differently this year because of uh, COVID, uh, but uh, they're gaining a tremendous amount of experience. In addition, for those of you who are either on campus or available by Zoom, I have office hours over at ThinkBox from two to four on Thursdays and I, we can set up Zoom meetings or telephone calls or uh, to some degree in-person meetings if you're currently a faculty or staff or a student uh, there and I can answer questions and I'm available for, for you to, to utilize. So today what we're going to do is talk about what we call intellectual property law. That's classically patents, trademarks, copyrights, trade secrets. It also includes a uh, right of publicity if you're famous. So if any of you are here are famous, we can squeeze that in uh, and uh, why those things should be important to you when we're going to talk about them in the context of a startup and also to some degree in a, an academic institution because I know some of you here are, are faculty members. So it's important to understand that each one of these rights is distinct. Some of them are created by you. Some of them are given to you by the government and you can't enforce anything until you have that done. There are certain deadlines that apply to most of these things. Otherwise you can lose rights. And there's also certain due diligence activities that you should be concerned about at some level, whether it's due diligence in terms of making sure you're not interfering with somebody else's rights that you might need to either avoid or acquire a license to or purchase. <clears throat> and also to know whether whatever it is that you've come up with might be protectable in some way that you, you have some degree of exclusivity. And we're going to try to squeeze all of that into one hour and also reserve some time so that you can answer questions about your specific situations. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, share my screen and uh, get started with what I call the intellectual property chart, which has all these pigeonholes for these things. And we'll talk about each one and, and show some examples. And at the end, I'll, I'll show one product that sort of encompasses everything so, to put it all into context. So this is what I call, and can somebody give me some thumbs up to see if you can see my screen? Thank you very much. So this is what I call the um, intellectual property chart. And it has these pigeonholes for um, all the different types of intellectual property. I'm trying to get my chat box to cooperate, but it's not, there it goes. All right, so the first thing I wanna talk about are these two types of patents. There's actually three types of patents. There's utility patents, design patents, and plant patents. But unless any of you are horticulturists here with a new geranium uh, we're going to skip plant patents for today. 
So utility patents protect the way things are made, the way they work, the way they uh, are used. And design patents protect the way things look. And we'll take a look at one of those in a minute. So utility patents are, and design patents are rights that are granted by, the, by national governments, either our government or foreign governments. And you don't acquire any patent rights until the government has reviewed an application that you filed and approved it. And you've paid them some money, both at the front end and the back end. That's very important to them. And once you have those rights, you can start enforcing them. There are some ways you can get your damages backdated a little bit early in the filing dates, but we won't go into that minutia today. Uh, so, as I said before, utility patents uh, cover the way things work, the way they're made, the way they're used. And specifically, they would cover methods and apparatuses, compositions of matter, like the polyploid oyster was the first living organism that was patented. Um, uh, methods of uh, making something, uh, method of using something, method of doing something, uh, a, a method for putting um, hermetically sealing uh, um, uh, chemotherapy vials with an automated apparatus um, and, and, and the apparatus itself and uh, the method for using those vials once they've been sealed, for example. But in no case does a utility patent cover an abstract idea. We had a very recent Supreme Court case in 2014, Alice versus CLS Bank, in case you're bored and you want something to read at night that will put you to sleep, which reminded patent attorneys and the patent office that abstract ideas are not patentable. And that was in the context of a computer program that optimized the purchase of certain securities. Uh, so basically, if it's an abstract method of doing the business, if it's a law of nature or a mathematical algorithm in the abstract, those kinds of things are patentable, they're ideas. Once they've been reduced to practice in an invention, they can be patentable. For example, if you have a method for opening a tire mold according to the Arrhenius equation, right? Now you've taken an, an algorithm and you've applied it to something in the real world and the patent office and the courts are gonna consider that to be patentable. Uh, if you have a computer program that optimizes the way the computer runs, that could be patentable. Certain data structures, if again, they're tied to the structure of a computer might be patentable. And all this is a little bit in flux since that Alice case, there's been other federal circuit cases that have tried to hone in on this difference. And there's a two-step test that we're not gonna get into unless you ask about it. So just keep in mind that basically, if you could do something on pencil and paper, even if it would take you a long time, that's not gonna be a patentable subject matter. And if you think about it, it makes some sense. After all, how would you enforce your patent against somebody who can do something in their head or can simply do it on a pencil and paper, how would you ever find out about it and enforce it? There are also some limitations on surgical methods and when they can be enjoined and when they can't be enjoined. So what right do you get with one of these utility patents? Well, it's not the right to practice your invention. It's merely the right to exclude other people from practicing your invention, specifically making it, using it, selling it, offering to sell it, or importing it into the United States if you have a US patent, and Canada if you have a Canadian patent, and there's a European regional patent that has to be validated in individual countries. So all those rights are, are national. And remember, it's issued by the federal government or some other national government. You can't generate patent rights on your own. What's the standard for patentability? Well, this is, uh, this is pretty interesting. Only things that are new, useful, and unobvious to an artisan of ordinary skill in the art are considered to be patentable. And your patent application has to point that out specifically. So uh, we'll look at a, a patent application in just a moment, but uh, the, the front part of it is basically an instruction manual that uh, tells somebody how to put together the bicycle on Christmas morning. And the last half of it are what we call the patent claims. And those describe things that are new, means there's nothing identically like it. Useful, means it's not perpetual motion or it's not an abstract idea. And unobvious to a person of ordinary skill in the art to which the invention pertains. And that's what we're arguing with the patent office about 80% of the time. So what, what is the prior art? Well, the prior art is everything that was sold or offered for sale or publicly used in the United States more than one year prior to your filing date. It's anything that's described in a printed publication anywhere in the world uh, more than one year prior to your filing date. So all of the 10 million issued US patents, the 25 million issued foreign patents, that's all the world of prior art. And nine out of 10 of those patents have never been commercialized. So you really have no idea what's in the prior art until you look, look at that patent database. 
It's also all the published literature and trade journals and things like that. It's all of the dissertations that are in our library here. That's part of the prior art. So the patent office only has access to a tiny part of that electronically. So you have an obligation to tell the patent office about prior art that you know about when you file your patent application. So let's go ahead and, and uh, take a look at a, a patent app, a, an issued patent right now. See what that looks like. So this is a utility patent and it starts off with a, let me move these things out of the way here. It starts off with a number in the upper right hand corner, the issue date and the name of the inventor. Well, how about that? Look at that inventor's name, what a surprise. So in this case, uh, this utility patent relates to a, a camera bag and it has an abstract on the front that very quickly in one paragraph, tells people what the invention is all about. And it's got some biographical data about prior art patents that the examiner looked at and deciding whether to issue this and, uh, patent or not, including prior art submitted by the, the applicant. See other publications, there's a catalog there. And a series of drawings with reference numerals. And those drawings, uh, when read with the reference numerals and the written specification that follows, would enable a person of ordinary skill in the art to make use the invention. There's a you know, discussion here about whether there's any related applications, some background about the technology that the invention relates to, and uh, a brief summary of the invention. And then these uh, some paragraphs that describe the drawings, and then these numbered paragraphs with the reference numerals that refer back to the drawings to teach someone how to make and use the the best the best embodiment, the best mode for carrying out the invention. And then here's the part where the patent attorneys make their money, the claims. And these claims are going to determine who infringes and who doesn't infringe. And these are the things that have to be new, useful, and unobvious over the prior art. Now, there's more than one claim. And the reason is, uh, well, if you just have one good broad claim, why do you need more than one? Well, during litigation, someone may prove to the court that claim one is not uh, unobvious, that in fact, it's obvious over some combination of prior art that the examiner didn't know about. So we put in claim two just in case claim one's invalid, and hopefully claim two will save the day, or claim three, or claim 15, or when we get to the end, claim 20. And that's what a US utility patent looks like. Now, earlier I said, and I, I'm not able to monitor questions while I've got the share screen on, so hopefully um, uh, Doug or someone will keep an eye on whether there's any questions or not, let us know. Uh, it doesn't give you the right to practice the invention. It gets, gives you the right to stop other people from making things that fall under those claims. So for example, if we go back to the stone age, and there's a rock and a stump and a log and we're sitting around the fire and everybody's uncomfortable and somebody invents the stool three legs in a seat it says i claim a seating device comprising magic word means including but not limited to a horizontal seat and three downwardly depending legs stone age patent office looks at it and says well the prior art is the rock the stump and the log no suggestion there for three legs so here's your patent well now you um, start making stools and I take a look at that stool and I say, that's great, but you know, my back still hurts and I want some place to rest my arms. So I come up with a chair, four legs, the seat, arms, the back, all connected together. And I file a patent application for that. Patent office looks at the rock, the stump, the log and the stool and says, well, there's no suggestion here for a back and arms. So Professor Felici gets his chair patent. Now, just because I have, have the chair patent doesn't mean I don't infringe your stool patent because my chair still has at least a horizontal seating surface and three downwardly dependent legs. So you and I meet at the river and we say, how are we gonna work this out? And we say, well, I'll tell you what, um, for every, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make the offer to you, Mr. Patent Holder on the stool, for every chair that I sell, I will give you two clams. I'll charge six for the chair and I'll give two to you and that'll be the royalty. And that's how you and I work out the, the infringement issue. All right, let's go back to, so let's look at the design patent. The design patent is like the utility patent, except it covers the non-functional aesthetic appearance of industrial designs and other products. Uh, the statute uses the, the word uh, articles of manufacture, the term they use for design patents. And here's the typographical error. It covers, it, 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 it covers the, that aesthetic appearance, but it will not protect the appearance of designs that are dictated by function. So to the extent there's only one way to make something, and that's the best way to make it, like a ball bearing, should be nice and round and spherical. 
So if that's the only way to make a ball bearing that, that functions, then the design patent can't cover that. And just like a utility patent, it's the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing a substantially similar design. Again, it's issued by the federal government after an application process. And the standard for obtaining the rights are exactly the same, novelty, utility, and unobviousness. So what does a design patent look like? So the design patent looks a lot like the utility patent. There's a patent number with an issue date, name of the inventor, some biographical information, a list of the prior art that was considered. The claim is very simple. The ornamental design for or whatever it is is shown and described and some description of the drawings and the drawings themselves. I think there is a little prettier than the utility patent drawings. There's some nice shading in here to show what curvature there is, just the six orthographic projections and a perspective or isometric view. And someone infringes this by making something which in the eyes of an ordinary observer is the thing shown in the patent drawing. So you need substantial identity for design patent infringement. But unlike some other things we're gonna talk about today, independent creation and thing like, things like that are not defenses to um, design patent infringement. So let me go back to the chart if I can. So what about deadlines? When do you have to file these things? Well, the United States is a grace period country as in Canada. And then in the United States, you get one year from your first sale, offer for sale or public use of the invention in the United States to get your US patent on file. Other foreign countries are what we call absolute novelty countries. And they require that a patent application be on file somewhere before there's any public disclosure of the invention. And those of you who are academics, this is, I'm sure you know this backwards and forwards. But we have a little bit of a legal fiction that helps us out. The United States uh, is a part of the Paris Convention for the Protection of Intellectual Property. Must have been a nice meeting under the Eiffel Tower. I'm sure they went to a nice cafe afterwards. And what they all agreed to as national countries was that they would grant reciprocal rights to nationals of each other's countries. And they would engage in a legal fiction that if a patent application was filed in their country within a certain deadline, but a national application had been filed in the domicile of the inventor's own country previously within that deadline, the foreign country would pretend that the application was filed in that foreign country on the day it was filed in the country of the domicile. Very complex, so let's give it an example. You file a patent application in the United States today. Tomorrow, you publicly disclose the invention. 364 days later, you file a French application claiming the benefit of priority of the previously filed US application. Because it's within a one-year period, the French Patent Office pretends that the French patent application was filed one year ago, the day before your public disclosure. So as far as they're concerned, your patent application was filed before the public disclosure. Same thing happens for design patents, except the period is six months instead of, uh, instead of 12 months. So that's the way you can preserve your, your foreign filing rights. We also have something special in the United States, which is hmm, somewhat new, called a provisional patent application. You may have heard of this. The provisional application is just like a regular utility application. By the way, there's no provisionals for designs except the provisional application doesn't have to have any patent claims. So you really don't have to know what exactly is new, useful, or unobvious about your invention at the time you file it. You just file an enabling disclosure. For a mechanical invention, it could be as simple as a stack of assembly drawings, right? Uh, for a method, uh, it would be uh, steps for how to perform the method and maybe an example of an experiment that shows that the method has act actually has utility, particularly important in chemical cases or, or bioengineering cases. And then within 12 months of that date, same period as the Paris Convention, you can file a regular utility application with claims referring back to that provisional application. And the U.S. Patent Office will pretend that your non-provisional application was filed on the day the provisional application was filed. And the big benefit, there are some international uh, filing mechanisms. There are no international patents, but there's an, a mechanism for filing an international patent application, which you can base off that provisional application as well. So uh, you'll get 12 months to get your international application on file. And by the way, you can enter the United States with that international application as well. And that means you can extend the date that you actually file your US non-provisional application up to 30 months after the provisional filing date. So that's a really great benefit. So um, we've talked about the critical deadlines that the same for design and utility patents. They have different terms. The utility patent is 20 years from the earliest filing date you're entitled to. The design patent is 14 years or now 15 years from its issue date. They still kept that pretty much uh, 
the old fashioned way. So that's everything I want to tell you today about utility patents and design patents. Does anybody have any questions before we move forward with trademarks? Again, I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see if any of you have a raised hand. No questions in the chat so far, but if anyone does have any questions, feel free right, to let's move on here. to trademarks and service marks. So what is a trademark or service mark? It's really anything that identifies a single source for goods or services. It could be a word, a phrase, a logo, a, um, an advertising slogan, a package of design, a product shape, an aroma, um, uh, a series of tones, the NBC tone, anything that identifies a single source for goods or services, even if the source is unknown. So an example might be Coca-Cola, right? We all know if we see a beverage with Coca-Cola on the side, that that probably comes from the people that make the cola drink that we're familiar with. If we see a beverage in a wasp waste fluted bottle, we probably know that that product comes from the same place that we get the cola beverage that we like. If we see a red background with a white swoosh through it on the side of a beverage truck, we know it's probably carrying the cola beverage that we're familiar with. Um, if we hear a slogan, uh, it's the real thing, right? That's dating me a little bit, but that was associated with that beverage that we're all familiar with. And I would also argue, probably unsuccessfully, that it's also a guarantor quality. When you go to a McDonald's anywhere in the country, you know that the product you're gonna get is gonna be the same, whether it's high quality or low quality. And so that's also a function of a, of a trademark or service mark. Um, with respect to uh, trademarks, there is a spectrum of protectability. At the far end are totally arbitrary marks, like red ball for shoes. At the other end, where things are not protectable, are the generic designations of products or the name of, of a product that comes from multiple sources. Uh, and you can all probably think of uh, things like that. Shoes for footwear would be generic. In between are protectable marks. At the weekend are descriptive marks, like runner for footwear, anything that describes, or laudatory marks like best or finest, anything that describes the quality of the product. But they can become trademarks if the public begins to associate the mark with a single source through exclusive use over a long period of time. That's called secondary meaning. And if you prove that to the trademark office, they'll give you a registration. Unlike patents, trademark rights are generated merely by using the mark on a product or a mark in association with the advertising of services and distributing those in commerce. That generates trademark rights. It generates them market area by market area. So if you have somebody using a Meldos for ladies shoes in Washington, somebody else using it in Florida and they meet the Mississippi River, neither one can go into the other's market areas. They both have rights there. So the government, federal government has, has created an, um, an incentive to register those marks. Uh, if you register your trademark with the federal government and it's allowed, the government will backdate that registration to the filing date. And there will be a legal fiction that on that filing date, you were selling that product in all 50 states. So you generate nationwide trademark rights as of your filing date. And that's the benefit the government gives you for registration. So if you adopt the mark today in Washington state, file a federal trademark application tomorrow, and I adopt the same mark in Florida a week later, your trademark application issues as a registration, it's backdated at the filing date. That was ahead of my first use state in Florida. When you get to Florida, you can make me stop. There's actually a case on point, point called Don Donut. And if you're a fa fan of Don Donuts, you have the trademark office to thank for you being able to go to a Don Donut store and knowing what you're getting. So generic words and phrases which describe products available from different sources and descriptive marks uh, which don't have secondary meaning are not protectable. They'll never become protectable if they're generic. Like a patent, a trademark is the right to exclude newcomers from confusing the public as the source of those goods or services. Uh, it also is the prima facie the right for you to use the mark, but there's always the possibility that someone somewhere that you don't know about was using it ahead of you, and that person you'll never be able to stop. So how are the rights acquired? One, by use. And two, by registration, if you intend to use a mark in the future, you can reserve it in the trademark office. You can also reserve it at the state level. And then when you actually have use of the mark, assume that your application has been approved, you submit a declaration saying, hey, I'm now using it, here's some more money, and you get your registration certificate, again, backdated to the filing date. What's the standard for obtaining protection? 
that whatever mark you're using is not confusingly similar to a mark that's already in use or already registered. Are there critical deadlines? Well, yes, because people can file these intent to use applications without having any actual use of the mark. So you won't be aware of it in the marketplace. So if you wanna use a mark and you don't see it in the marketplace, you better take a look at the federal register and the state registers to make sure somebody doesn't have one of these um, intent to use applications pending because when they mature, their rights get backdated to filing date. And those trademark registrations will last indefinitely uh, if your use isn't abandoned. You do have to renew trademark applications at certain uh, intervals, but it's a relatively simple process. So that's sort of the basics of trademark law. Does anybody have any questions about that? All right, let's move on to copyrights. What is a copyright? Well, this is something we're all familiar with. We've all picked up books, opened it up, saw the C in the circle, Macmillan, Houghton, with a year of publication, and we know that means that publisher thinks they have a copyright in that book. Um, so we know copyrights apply to things like books and movies uh, and sculptures and works of art, but they also apply to other textual works that we may not be familiar with in terms of copyright, like computer programs. So where computer programs today may have difficulty finding protection under the patent law, they can have protection uh, under the copyright law. And what rights do you get with a copyright? Well, it's the right to exclude others from making, using, distributing copies and making derivative works, like a book from a movie from a book or a modification to a computer program that you've licensed somebody to use. Unlike patents and a little bit like trademarks, you create copyrights on your own. The moment a work is fixed in a tangible medium, you take pen to paper or your keystrokes are recorded on magnetic medium or you take a picture and it's fixed in acetate film or digital film or you record a performance. That work is now copyrighted. There's very little originality required for copyright. It just has to have some, uh, some authenticity, something original to you that you didn't derive from somewhere else. Uh, and you're, you have a copyright and you're entitled to go and register it. So uh, are there deadlines associated? But by the way, what's the test for copyright infringement? Two things. The infringer had to have access to the copyrighted work and it has to be, the copy has to be substantially similar to the copyrighted work to an ordinary observer. So if somebody independently creates something that's substantially similar to your copyrighted work, it can't be copyright infringement. Independent creation is a complete defense. NEC back in the days when they were competing with Intel for microprocessors uh, wanted to emulate the, um, uh, I forget which chip it was that Intel was selling at the time. I think, it, I don't remember. So anyways, uh, when they developed the V20 processor, they gave their software engineers the inputs and the outputs of the Intel microprocessor for a whole bunch of different uh, cases. And they say, come up with some software in between. It does the same thing. And they did that without access to the Intel code. And Intel sued them for copyright infringement and lost because uh, NEC was able to prove that they designed it in a clean room without reference to Intel software, even though the end, in the end, the, the result was, was very similar. Are there critical deadlines? Well, yes and no. You're not going to lose any rights anymore since 1989 if you fail to register your copyright or something like that. But if you want to be able to get your attorney's fees paid by the other side, and if you don't want to have to prove your damages and you want to elect damages within a range under the statute, you need to have a copyright application on file within three months of your first publication of the work. Again, there's a legal fiction. If you file today, there's an infringement. I'm sorry, you, you, uh, you publish today, there's an infringement tomorrow. Within three months of publication, you file your registration. It will have an effective date prior to the infringement, which means you get your full range of attorney's fees and statutory damages. Thanks to Sonny Bono, formerly wife of, of Cher. Uh, he was a, 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 a congressman from California and he passed through Congress, the Sonny Bono Copyright Extension Act. And due to that, copyrights now last for the life of the author plus 70 years, or if it's a corporation or partnership that owns a copyright, 95 years. So you'll often see, see in a circle, name of the copyright owner, your first publication. Well, what, what's that all about? You don't need to do that to preserve your copyright. But if you own a copyright and you want to license it or you want to sell it, 
it's in your best interest to put that notice on there because then people will go to the copyright office, look to see if you have a registration. If you do, they'll find out who you are and they'll be able to contact you for, for authority for reprints, to get a license, uh, if you're gonna require that of them or if you wanna sell the copyright to them, uh, that can be done. One of the strange things about the copyright is when you pay for a work, like you go to a photographer and you have a picture taken of you, or you hire an independent contractor and you have them uh, do a painting or a sculpture for you, or you hire a programmer and you have them write a program for you based on a flowchart that you prepared. Um, you don't own the copyright in that work because you're not the one who fixed the work in the tangible medium. That independent contractor was. So he or she owns the copyright. To get it, you have to get it assigned to you in writing. There's something called the Work Made for Hire Doctrine, which says that for certain types of audiovisual works and for other works where the person, the author is an employee of your company. So you pay their FICA, you pay their taxes, uh, you pay their l &I insurance, their regular employees, your brainwaves are going through their arms and creating the work and the company is the author, not the individual. But there are limits on what the Work Made for Hire doctrine applies to. You can get into a written agreement with somebody that says, I'm gonna hire you to write this computer program for me and you, in return for getting paid, you hereby assign it to me. We also agree that it's a work made for hire and courts will uh, acknowledge that and treat those things as work made for hire, vesting the copyright in you. Um, so I think that's all I wanted to say about copyrights now, right now. Does anybody have any questions about that? Uh, Jonathan Healy had questions, so just jump in if you have one. Jonathan Healy had a question. I'm not sure if he's still on, but I can ask it for him. Um, All right, let's move on to trade secrets. By the way, uh, to register your copyright, go to the Copyright Office, www.copyright.gov. There are forms there, form TX for textual works, VA for visual works, SR for sound recordings, and there are instructions on how to fill out all those forms. The system is really set up for non-attorneys to use. If you're interested in registering a computer program and you want to retain trade secrets in that program, which is what we're going to talk about next, look at Circular 61. Circulars are publications by the Copyright Office, and it will show you how to redact information from the computer program which you, when you submit your deposit to the, to the Copyright Office. Back in the days of paper, you always submitted two deposits. The Copyright Office is a division of the Library of Congress. One was for examination by the Copyright Office. The other one was for the Library of Congress, and that's how the Library of Congress is built up through registrations for copyright applications. Now, most people file electronically, so they don't require two copies anymore. All right, last thing on the chart, trade secrets. There's a little bit of tension here between trade secret law and patent law. Patents, the whole purpose of the patent system is to create a database of public disclosures uh, for things that are new, useful, and unobvious so that people can do literature searches look at how other people have designed jet engines before and build on that. Now they can't duplicate what's in an issued patent unless it's expired, right? But they can still learn from it. Uh, they can learn from data in experiments, in chemical cases where there's examples given of the experiments run to show that the chemical composition is useful and that the experiment works and produces it. So all of that data, huge database with the patent office is a huge technical literature database and in return for giving those public disclosures, the government gives back a limited monopoly. There are some processes, however, which can be retained secret almost indefinitely. For example, the formula for Coca-Cola is said to be maintained as a trade secret. And I've been told that at least for some period of time, the, the syrup was in Atlanta and they would ship it to the bottlers and the bottlers would add water and syrup, uh, sugar and bottle it, but nobody knew how to make the syrup. And then even if you put a a, the syrup through a mass spectrum analyzer, you might be able to see where the, the peaks are for different chemicals, but you can't exactly figure out how it all got put together. There are lots of other processes that are not reverse engineerable. For example, if you're making extrusions, it's basically impossible to figure out from an extrusion what the tolerances in the, in the dye were, uh, even if you could figure out what the shape of the dye was. And if you don't know the tolerances, you're not gonna be able to produce parts that meet up when you miter them at 45 degree angles. Uh, uh, similarly, manufacturing tolerances, tolerances. You can look at a machine and all the gears and you might be able to get the dimensions right, but you don't know what the tolerances are. And if you don't know what the tolerances are, you can get stacking errors. And when you put all the gear train together, it will jam. So the uh, tolerances that are on um, 
blueprints and, and drawings are the sorts of things that could be trade, trade secrets. Very common trade secrets is any sort of recipe or formula um, in the business world, customer lists, um, uh, things like that are trade secrets that are not reverse engineerable. So you really have to decide, do you want to trade in your trade secret and get a patent, which is going to give you a limited period of monopoly and basically no affirmative defenses to infringement? Or do you want to try to retain that knowledge as a trade secret? If the cat gets out of the bag, even if it's through misappropriation, the trade secret is lost. You might be able to get damages for the misappropriation, but you'll never be able to get that trade secret back. Furthermore, if somebody can reverse engineer the process or the product through legitimate means, uh, they have a complete defense to trade, to trade secret infringement. So upfront, you kind of have to make a decision. A lot of software people in the early days said, we're not going to get patents. We're just going to keep the uh, we're going to keep the uh, the source code secret we're going to put it in a vault we're going to give limited access to it um, um, nobody will be able to reverse compile the object code into the source code they won't be able to figure out how we're really doing things and besides that the technology moves so quickly by the time we get an issued patent the software is going to change and we don't want to bother with it that was certainly microsoft's philosophy at one time they've changed their minds over time uh, but there is this tension between the two so what do trade secrets protect? Secret industrial processes, customer lists, know-how, technical drawings. Any knowledge that is not secret and gives a commercial advantage to the entity that holds it. Uh, the rights acquired are the right to collect damages for misappropriation, basically, and the right to get an injunction against somebody like a departing employee, a key man employee who has that trade secret information in his head or her head, you can get an injunction to get that, that person from using that information in a new employer and enjoying the new employer from using it if it gets disclosed anyways. So it does give you some after the fact protection. What do you have to do to acquire it? Well, it has to be confidential business information that gives the holder an economic advantage and you have to make reasonable efforts to keep it secret. So fence around the factory with barbed wire at the top, non-disclosure agreements signed by people who come into the factory to look at the processes uh, and limiting the number of people that are exposed to the secret. There's no critical deadline with association with trade secrets, and they can last forever. So that's fundamentally the basics of patent, trade secret, trademark, copyright law. Um, and I'll take a moment now to stop sharing my screen and ask any of you if you have any questions. And if you don't, I'll give you an example of something that sort of ties all this together. It looks like there's a question in the um, right. Zoom. You're all in a coma? Oh, sorry. I haven't understood anything. Or I'm Michael, can you hear me? lecturer in the history of the intellectual property venture firm. So the product I want to show you, let's start off this way. Uh, many years ago, uh, I had a very clever client. And he started off business with his engineering partner, uh, uh, making interfaces to make daisy wheel uh, typewriters act like computer printers, all right? So he created a physical device that emulated uh, the make and break codes of, a, of the computer keyboard so that the computer could output uh, printing information to a standard daisy wheel printer, save people a lot of money. I came up with some other inventions after that. And one day he was uh, considering buying an alarm system for his home. And uh, he looked around his neighborhood and saw these metal switch plates on door jams and. People were putting a key in, they turn it, the light blinked, and people didn't break into their homes. In fact, doing some research, he found that 94% of all homes with alarm systems did not have any break-ins. So he concluded that the real value of the alarm system was the visual deterrence of the switch plate on the front of the house and all the hardware in the back that cost thousands of dollars was only useful in about 6% of the cases. So he decided that he was gonna come up with a product that just simulated the appearance of an alarm system faceplate. He came up with this. So we got a little bit of reflection here, but hopefully you can see this. And essentially it's a stainless steel plate with a key switch, some LEDs and enough thickness so that inside the plate, there's a 555 timer, two AAA battery holders, a cam, on the switch, and you're not gonna be able to see it in this lighting, 
Perhaps you can, yes. There's a little coil spring right there. Hopefully you can see that spring and it's movable. And when this cam rotates, it pushes that coil spring, which is attached to one of the legs of the 555 timer against the stainless steel plate, completes the circuit, and these lights on the front start to blink. So when you leave your house in the morning, you get the key, you put it in. I've lost the key, so I can't demonstrate it for you. Lights start to blink. When you come home at night, you put the key in, turn the switch, the lights stop blinking. And that simulates the appearance of an alarm system. And these were enormously popular. Millions of dollars worth of this product were um, sold. And we prepared utility patents on this, uh, directed to this spring mechanism, which was unique. But the client, being very clever, said, you know, what I really want is to stop anybody from making a product that simulates the appearance of an alarm system. So I just want a patent that would cover something with a, a plate and a, an interior compartment and some batteries and a circuit and, and a switch and some lights that's all self-contained. And we said, well, we, we don't think that's patent. We don't think the patent office is going to do that. So the client said, I don't care. Do it anyways. I'm paying the bill. So we did it. And he got that patent. And people started to make modules that go inside cars that stuck on there with Velcro that had lights and some kind of actuating mechanism. And all those people paid him royalties. And he was able to quit his job at a um, company that made defibrillators at the time and just make these for the next uh, 17 years. At that time, that was the term of the patent. And um, I made all, all kinds of money doing that. So question for the audience, would the client be able to get a design patent on this? Carolina, I see you're very fascinated by this topic. You think you could get a design patent on this when it looks just like the switch plates that are already out in the marketplace? I don't think so. No, not by the design only, the exterior design. You might have to unmute yourself. Um, I, I did. Um, oh, Carolina, we're not okay. hearing you. We can hear you, Carolina. Michael, can you hear oh, us? I'm not hearing you either. I guess it's my headset. Michael, can you hear us? Michael, can you hear us? Now I can. Okay, sorry. Oh. Carolina, can you repeat? She did. Can you repeat your comment? I. I don't believe he can patent the design, the exterior design. Uh, because it's not novel, right? It's Correct. not any different than the plates that were already out there. So he couldn't get a design patent on this. But he got a copyright on this useful article. Excellent. Natalie. Thank you. Natalie. Natalie, can you hear us? Hello. Yes. Okay. I Natalie. I didn't I I I couldn't um I couldn't hear what the question was. Question is, could the client get a copyright on this useful article? I still think I, I don't believe so. Excellent. You're correct because useful articles are not works of authorship, like books or movies, things like that. Right. Yeah. So. His, he did get the, design, the utility patent. It was useful. Couldn't get a design patent because it's not novel. Can't get a copyright. So, uh, and it's pretty much reverse engineerable because there wasn't any sophisticated software going on in here. It's just a 555 timer. So that pretty much exhausts the intellectual property rights in this product. But he did come up with some very nice packaging and a name for the product. He originally wanted to call this and by the way, does this show up backwards on your screens? The name, can anybody read the name? Yes, Scarecrow. Right, it's backwards on my screen. So he originally wanted to call this Alarmco because there was a company called Ademco that put their name on the front of the plates. And he thought Alarmco sounded a lot like Ademco and thought he might be able to trade off their goodwill. Is that problematic? Ronald. I think, I think so. Yeah, because consumers would think that this product maybe comes from the same people that make the Ademco product, and that's classic trademark infringement. 
So he changed the name to Scarecrow, which is pretty, I think it's a pretty good trademark. Is it a generic designation from a, for alarm plates that come from multiple sources? Roseanne. What was that question again? Have you ever heard of um, scarecrow alarm plates that come from multiple places? I have not. This thing, this thing a scarecrow, is that what this is? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't call it the scarecrow by just looking at it. What is a scarecrow? Uh, a, a stuffed shirt and pants uh, with hay to scare off birds. So what's the connection between a scarecrow and this thing? Um, the scarecrow looks like a person, but it's not. And this box looks like an alarm, but it's not. So that's pretty good. I, I think the connection would be that they both have a similar function. They scare off things that you don't want to have around. That's called a suggestive trademark because it suggests some quality of the product rather than describing it directly. And suggestive marks don't require secondary meaning. And they're usually not infringements because people like to give their products common names. So in the few minutes we have left, I want to talk about due diligence, unless anybody has any questions. So what are you, what's your due diligence for you or your company? Uh, your due diligence is two things. Make sure you're not infringing somebody else's rights. And can you get some protection yourself? So how do you determine whether or not, for example, you might be infringing a patent? Well, the first thing to do, we'll take this in the order of, of, of the greatest marginal benefit and smallest marginal cost. First thing you wanna do is look at similar products that you, or your product either you're gonna compete with or that you might be improving upon and look for patent numbers on the product. Patent owners have an incentive to put the patent number on the product. They don't, they can't collect damages for infringement if they sue somebody. So most products that are patented will have a patent number on it. Go to the patent office website, www.uspto.gov and you can do a simple search by plugging in the number and you can pull up the patent and you can read it. If it looks problematic, get a hold of a patent, your patent attorney and have them do an analysis. Second thing you can do, again at the patent office website, is if you know who the players in the industry are. For example, this client knew that the player in the industry was called a Demco. You can look for all the patents owned by a Demco. Um, and there may be a lot or there may be a few. And if there's a few, you can look at all of them. If there's a lot, you start weeding them out uh, just by reading the abstracts and looking at the drawings. And then the ones that look problematic, you ship off to a patent attorney. And the third thing is to hire a pretend professional search service. Uh, not a patent attorney because they're too expensive to do that, but a professional search service can look for patents that claim uh, something similar to what you want to make. Uh, so those are your, your due diligence aspects for, for avoiding patent infringement. Is your invention patentable? Well, you do something similar. You'd look at the patent office records to see uh, what prior art there is out there. Again, you can hire a professional search firm. Those types of searches are not very expensive to do. You're maybe only looking at $800 to $1,600 to hire a professional searcher, tell them what your invention is. They'll keep everything confidential. And they'll send you back the dozen or so closest patents. And then you, if there's one that's identically like what you're going to do, you know, you're lacking novelty, you can't get a patent. But if there's two or three that maybe you could put them together to come up with your invention, well, you'd probably want to get the opinion of a patent attorney about whether he or she would be able to beat a rejection like that from the patent office. So that's your due diligence for avoiding infringement. There's your due diligence for uh, seeing if you can get a patent. Uh, with respect to trademarks, we talked that about, about that a little bit. If you're gonna adopt a mark, you haven't adopted it yet, you wanna look at the federal register and the state trademark registers to see if anybody's got a confusingly similar mark. You use the same search tools at the trademark office website as the patent office website. It's all together, www uspto.gov. You can search for identical marks. That's easy. Um, it'll look for pluralities. If you're looking for something more sophisticated than that, hire a professional searcher to do it. Uh, with respect to copyrights, it's real easy to avoid copyright infringement. Don't copy. Uh, as soon as you pick something up and you put it on the photocopy machine, you push the button. If the copyright still is extant and hasn't expired, you're a copyright infringer. Uh, things get more complicated when you're talking about the so-called fair use doctrine, right? You're allowed to copy facts, uh, things that are ideas from works, but you can't copy the way they're expressed. It's sometimes called the idea expression dichotomy, and you probably need some advice from somebody who specializes in copyright law if you're going to 
use somebody else's materials to see how much you can use and, and how much you can't. And with respect to trade secrets, it's very it's simple. Just don't misappropriate anybody else's secret. Uh, but if you can reverse engineer it, it's free for you to use. Okay, we have uh, uh, eight minutes left, according to my watch. So we can either all go home early or I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have about any of these things. If any of you have cases that are currently pending before the uh, Patent, Trademark, or Copyright Offices, uh, obviously we don't want you to disclose any specifics of your confidential information, but if you want some some general answers about how that process works and where you are in it, I'd be, I'd be pleased to answer those questions as well. Great, thanks, Michael. Any, any questions in the few minutes we have left? Ms. Ball, I saw that you had put a question in the chat earlier. Did you want to uh, unmute and ask Michael your question? Uh, sure. Uh, Michael, I had one question about like your trade secret. So let's say you have a business process and one of your employees like go ahead and publicize the secret. So it's no longer a secret in, anymore. So in that case, like does the trade secret like holder get any repressions from the government or from the infringer or anything like that? So the question is, for those of you who may not have heard it, if you have an employee, they disclose the trade secret, uh, the cat's out of the bag, everybody knows about it now, what remedies or recourse do you have? Well, it depends on whether or not that employee breached a duty. Uh, the, the duty to keep information confidential can be created by a written agreement, like an employment agreement, where your employee promises to keep information confidential. It can also be created by circumstances. Uh, there's a very famous case involving Sears and Roebuck and the ratchet wrench that has the button on the end that ejects the ratchet socket. The inventor went in, he didn't have a patent. He said, I've got a secret invention I wanna to disclose to you guys. Uh, and here it is, there was no agreement signed, but the door was closed and uh, the disclosure had a reasonable expectation that that would be kept secret. Court decided that uh, there was an obligation of confidentiality. And when Sears went ahead and made uh, Craftsman ratchet wrenches with that button, they had breached that duty of confidentiality and they had to pay them damages. So to the answer to your question is it comes down to was your employee obligated to keep that information confidential, either through an explicit obligation of confidentiality evidenced by some written agreement or by the circumstances surrounding it, uh, that situation? Did he know he was under an obligation to keep it secret? And if so, you could get damages from him. Unfortunately, once the secret is out and other people start using it, you can't collect anything from them. That's why it's very important that you make reasonable efforts to keep confidential information confidential. And that means in employment agreements having confidentiality clauses. And you're working with independent contractors that you've hired to work on a project to make sure that your independent contractor agreement has some sort of confidentiality clause so that you can take uh, recourse against them. Let's say your, your key employee goes to a competitor and you think he's about to disclose all that secret information. You can go to a court and get an injunction to prevent that for him from doing that before it happens and to prevent his company from using that information should they have gotten it from him. There's a very famous case uh, not too long ago involving a Ford Motor uh, employee who had done that. I forget where he came from, Toyota, or it was vice versa. And uh, there were uh, millions of dollars in damages awarded. And the court did uh, put some restraint on, I, I believe it was Ford, from using that information in products for a certain number of years until they would have caught up anyways. So hopefully that answers your, your question. Great, we probably have time for one more question. And I know Rebecca Manning, sometimes you're not able uh, to answer. I know you put a question in the chat. I'll just give you a second. If you wanted to unmute and ask it, if not, I will be happy to ask it for you. Okay, I will just go ahead and ask Rebecca's question um, for her, Michael. Um, Rebecca asks, if you have an idea for a web-based or apps-based platform, how do you approach intellectual property. Same thing with training or certifications given on a platform. I always struggle with the, with this because they aren't physical products. So an excellent question. So let's start off with, uh, we'll just take the first one first. So let's start off with the premise that ideas are not protectable. Uh, you've got to have something a little more concrete than that. So if you've got uh, an app, you know, you actually got code, right? 
the code's protectable through copyrights. Uh, it's protectable the minute it's fixed in a tangible medium, magnetic medium, or you've written it out somehow, right? Um, and those copyrights can be registered. And there's a way to register them by redacting sections of the code so that the trade secret isn't disclosed to the public. The second way to do it is with agreements with your, uh, the people that you're disclosing it to, that they're not gonna use, they're not gonna disclose that code outside the firm. They're not gonna use it for any purpose other than what the company permits them to use it for. And that's the primary way to do it. The third way, still a possibility, is through the patent system. Although uh, Alice versus CLS Bank has told us that algorithms and abstract ideas are not patentable, to the extent the web-based platform makes the machine run better, the platform run better, uh, to the extent you've got some novel data structures there, it may be protectable by utility patent. And you need to go and see, see a patent attorney about that. And hopefully those, those three methods provide you with some clarification as to where your path forward might be. Does anyone else have any questions? Well, I think we've wrapped this up uh, with one minute to spare. <laughs> I, I thank you all for your uh, attention uh, and uh, your questions. And I, I hope you find this useful. And please remember, uh, we're available to you. Uh, I'm at Thinkbox two hours a week where you can always call up and ask questions. And if you actually have a product or a business that's ready to go forward, you might want to give our intellectual property venture clinic a call here at the law school and we'll put you through the, um, the application process to see if you'd be a good match for our students. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. And thanks everybody for joining today. Great. Um, as we sit and wait election results, it's great to be focused on other things like intellectual property. So it was a great overview. And Michael, thanks for the support that you're providing the community and our students and um, would highly recommend that folks on this call or in your networks, you know, reach out to Michael and um, his willingness to engage uh, with folks and um, kind of at Thinkbox or sort of remotely um, as we do it um, this year.